Uh, my name is Claude Jones. I'm here right now at the Earth Center with the overseer of the Earth Center of Queens, New York. Introduce yourself, sir. Yes, my name is Boyman Kamenthu, first generation graduate of the Earth Center. I've been associated with the Earth Center for the past 11 years. I now have become the overseer of the Earth Center in charge of the daily operation of the Earth Center. And the Earth Center is a unique traditional African philosophy and spirituality school. We were blessed with Master Navala Musa Murodenrig, the prophet, who actually brought this information to us from Burkina Faso. And with the, uh, with the blessing of the elders of his community, the kingship, the high priests, the healers, they gave him the okay to come and bring that information to us that we were so sorely missing. The information that he brought us was basically coming from a traditional perspective. It is one of the few educational centers that I know of that is really devoid of any foreign influence, meaning it does not have a European or any other influence in it. It is purely chemetic and it's coming from West Africa, Burkina Faso. So that's one of the uniqueness of it. Within that paradigm, the education that we offer the community right now is based on three classes that was formulated and actually comes out of the Mtam school of ancient Kemet. So we're actually going through an initiation here in which we are offering three classes. The first class that we offer is the language which is called the Medumait, also known as the hieroglyphic. In that, we expose you to the language in of itself. We teach you how to read, write, and speak it, and the dynamic aspect that comes with the language in of itself. The second class we offer is the Sunt. That's the healing class. It's a class that teaches us how the human body works from a fundamental, traditional perspective, and how to heal that body using natural herbs and natural modalities. The third class that we offer is the Ka'at Ebi, which is known also in modern time as the meditation class. And the Ka'at Ebi is the one from which all modern forms of meditation comes from. They all can trace their roots to the Ka'at Ebi, such as uh, yoga, tai chi, and all of these modern forms of meditative aspects comes from the Ka'at Ebi. Dealing with the Western areas, uh, what do you think the Westerners mostly come to your classes? Are they more into it, uh, African more into the African culture, or have it been mostly hard to get them to understand the culture? Well, we have had many good, good receptions because our people of African descent, in particular, but generally speaking, are looking for something different, because the way we've been living our life, the way the modern system is directing the population, it seems like we're just not getting anywhere. It's like everything that's not helpful to a human being's development is not really stressed. It's more of a materialistic aspect. Traditionally now, we focus more on the spiritual development of individuals. So the class are basically directed towards helping and assisting the individual learn more about himself, herself, and their place relative to nature. All of our classes are based on our ancestors' understanding of the laws that governs nature. So with that said, everyone is quite interested in, in that type of education, which is unknown to them. And it's coming from a purely traditional, chemetic perspective, devoid of any foreign influence. So that really gets them stimulated. The challenges that most of them face is actually giving themselves that chance to actually expose themselves to what we are bringing to them and not try to judge it with the modern system education that they come with. So that's the difficult part, but we're gonna be here for the long time, we're gonna be here for the long journey, and we'll have to exhibit the patience and tolerance it takes to help our people recover from this modern colonial system way of educating us, which at the end of the day, it comes down to being destructive and self-destructive. Um, some people want to say, well, 
is this a religion? Is, what is, is it a religion area? Or a lot of people can confuse what exactly it is. It is not a religion, period. It's a way of life. It's a way of learning and understanding nature and how you, the individual and the collective human being, can fit into nature. It's not trying to impose our will on nature because nature is our teacher. Our first teacher was nature. So we try to fit in, into nature and not try to impose our will. And even that little simple concept is difficult at times for most people to grasp. Okay. Well, that's very, that's very interesting. So tell me a little more about uh, the attributes of it. Like, I mean, the areas, a lot of people think comedics as of King Tut or this. Give a break, give a little something about comedics. Kemetic. The term in of itself is basically an ancient term. That ancient term is still embedded within the tradition. The people who actually live it are still practicing and their old mindset is geared towards becoming, being a Kem. A Kem is a person who practices or live the way of, a, of the Kemetic paradigm or the Kemetic culture. Today, that term or, or the way it's defined, it's not really defined in a proper way. Kim is the person that practices that form of lifestyle, the committed lifestyle. Today, they see it as a region or a ge geographical location in Africa. But it's much more than that. It's much more than that. If a person is living by the principle that governs a camp, wherever they go in this world, that's Kemet. Because they are exhibiting those qualities, those characteristics, that's fundamentally from that Kemetic perspective. And there's two, two aspects I'll share with you that will really illustrate what a Kem or a Kemetic is. That is following the 77 commandment. Because in following the 77 commandment, it actually helps the individual to know how to live their life based on that kemetic value system and principles. So if you look here to the right, to my right, those are the 77 commandments that dictate how an individual who claims to be kemetic should be living his life or her life. And that's a traditional way of actually des uh, describing a comedic or chem person. Today, people will say, call themselves a chem, but they're not living by those principles. So in reality, they are actually uh, demeaning, the meaning of being a chem. It's either through out of ignorance that they just don't understand what a chem signifies or means, or they're just lacking the education. And that's where the Earth Center comes in. We are the ones now that are coming from that chemetic perspective and are breaking it down to show and teach people what it means to be a chem. So mm -hmm. I hear you have a very special uh, person come from Merita or areas to come in to speak upon behalf of uh, his sure. father. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I have here today with us in the, in the Earth Center the son of Master Navala Musa Muradenevi, and I would like for you to introduce you to him so that he can just share a few words of his father's work that he's carrying on, and uh, I'd like to introduce him, and that's Irita Shenmira Nava. We're here right now with the son of the person who did all this right here. Introduce yourself, sir. Uh, Ujai, this means greetings. Greetings to New York. Just got to New York yesterday, coming from uh, Africa. Well, my name is uh, Naba Irita Shenmira. Naba is uh, our bloodline name. 
So you go to my village, you will see many Nabas, uh, because in Africa, people are known or designated or identified by the kind of blood they carry in their bloodline. And uh, in our village or in our uh, place, uh, in the society, we carry the role of uh, priesthood, those in charge of uh, uh, communication between you know, the divine and the human. And uh, Irita is uh, my initiation name. Uh, in my society, every child who is born is uh, obliged to go through uh, the rite of uh, uh, initiation. And then after the initiation, you get a name because the initiation gives you uh, a way of life, gives you the, the guidelines of how you're supposed to live your life depending on all of the uh, things or all of the lives that you live, like afterlives that you went through, the experiences you went through in the afterlife, depending on that, you get a name that will allow you to carry on with uh, the kind of life you're coming to live. So Irita is uh, a comedic name. It's uh, a name come from uh, Medu, Medu language known by the West as uh, hieroglyphs. And uh, the meaning of Irita is uh, the friend or the companion of the planet of Earth. You know, and Shenmira is uh, a name that I share with the people or the other young people who went through initiation with me, we share that name as a, a generation name. And Shenmira means those protected by the great god Ra. So I'm from Burkina Faso, a Dogon bloodline, and uh, uh, from uh, Fadan Gurma. Fadan Gurma is a city or is a town located on the eastern side of Burkina Faso, if you look on the map. Okay. Do you get do you get mad sometimes of people training uh, commits or Africa with these movies of so many Europeans <laughs> saying they from the bloodlines of pharaohs but we know the truth? Do you get mad sometimes about that? Well, or, or not the, mad, but do you get upset a little bit? Well, if if I wasn't uh, you know I wasn't coming from uh, a place where you are taught or you are educated to look life or to approach life with uh, intelligence and uh, wisdom, I think I will really get mad at, uh, you know, everything, not just the movies, not just even like, you know, the white men trying to, you know, own our history or own, you know, the culture. I mean, the culture is something that, you know, you can't really own. You have to leave it. You have to be, you know, the one who produced it. So now, if you didn't produce the culture, but you still want to own the history of that culture, I mean, it's just kind of easy to see, you know, things with a uh, you know, certain level of understanding. And just the way we uh, go about it is like, well, these people are just people who don't have culture. Uh -huh. They're trying to have something in hands. Now, I'm a black person from Africa. I know my culture, I grew up in it, my culture educated me, initiated me, taught me everything. And this person here is different from me, but is lacking the humility and the, the intellectual and the spiritual honesty to, understand, to present himself or present himself as, a, hey, this is me, I'm a, a descendant of a European, we destroy all of your history. We do know what happened, but I'm just happened to be like, you know, the descendant of those people who did that to your people. But really, we appreciate all of that and we need it because we don't have anything. I travel a lot and uh, doing this work, I travel a lot and I end up understanding one thing. Because some things that happened in my village, I went to the middle of Europe somewhere in Wales. And I saw like the same construction, the same village hut, the same, you know, uh, dressing code and all of that. I'm like, man, what happened to you guys? They're like, you know, we used to send our people, you know, to go to your country, to go to your land, to study, 
you know, astronomy, to study spirituality and all of that. But at some point, Roman came and destroyed us. Uh, I'm like, well, I thought we were thinking in Africa, like we the only one, the Roman and the Greeks came and destroyed. So they did the same thing to you guys in Europe too? It's like, yeah, they did the same thing. So, I mean, watching out those things, what I would have to say with uh, kind of a minimum of uh, honesty is that as a black boy or a black child or a black, hum a, a black being, one thing is like just our color is already making other people envy us. I don't say that they hate us. It's not a hate. It's almost like envy, you know. Those people envy you. They envy just looking at you. Now, just looking at you, if someone can envy you, can you imagine all of the things about you or all of the things that makes you? Can you imagine how much the person is ready to kind of, you know, uh, go? How far the person is, uh, you know, ready to go in order to get whatever you, uh, you have to own it? So, in that situation, when you look at the situation that way, it's almost like, you know, someone has a history, they stand on it, value it, the other person doesn't have it, but lacking humility, discipline to come and say, can you teach me? Or can you really help us rebuild our society after the Roman destroyed us? Because, you know, practically you guys kept yours. If they have that humility and that sense of discipline to come and, you know, ask, yeah, well, black people will be like, well, on that note, we're gonna help you guys. But no white man want to see a black man, you know, being like their teacher. Now, if there's some, we can still be, feel like, hey, we wanna be like you. Well, the culture is not about the skin color. The culture is not about, you know, the social, you know, uh, standards or anything. The culture is about the way, it's a way of life. You have to live it. So I don't think my people, you know, black people should be getting frustrated and angry when they see, you know, a white man trying to represent their culture and their history. You know, that's really like what I can say on that note. Okay. Yeah. Well, every honest says every, and it sheds a lot of note on it, you know, it shows a lot of note because when I, when I was growing up, how I came to Earth Center area yeah. was because I was going, I had to see about a lot of Egypt's pictures. I'm like, something wrong with this picture. Yeah. Now you see like Ten Commandments, but I see how so come they got, Color people in the world like of oh, Tick Mammoth, but they got white people playing the pharaohs. I said, ain't right. So I started researching and more and more could draw me to the area of Comelic's area. Yeah. And the Comelic area. So I was looking all around the place for different stuff that came to the Earth Center. What people need to understand is uh, that you know, white man is just, you know, doing what his ancestors were doing as well. Because, you know, when you look at them or you look at this culture. You look at the way everything is in the West. I mean, it's something that, you know, was set up by the Greeks. Everybody will agree that they, you live in like, you know, in this place, in this modern society, you live in like, you know, the modern, you know, the, 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 the mind of the Greeks, you know. You can look at the buildings. The buildings are like a Greek, you know, model and all of that. So they set up everything to just be like, a, you know, according to, your, to their principles. So the Greeks, when they first, or the Romans, when they first came to our, our lands, they came to meet our people, it was the same thing. You know, just the lack of humility and the lack of uh, discipline. That's why even like in the culture back home, that's how we call anytime we see someone, even like someone who's looking like us, black like us, and coming, you know, back from uh, the West, and coming from the West and coming to visit his people or his land for the first time, by coming with uh, the mentality of uh, the West, we just like, this is another descendant of the Greeks who just coming to visit us again. Even though the person looks, you know, dark skin, look black, look like us and all of that. So when we talk about whiteness and all of that, it's about, you know, the mentality mm -hmm. and it's about, you know, how uh, you approach existence. So the white people, those who have like, you know, skin, white skin, they're not even white because this is what I would consider to be white. Uh -huh. You know, let's say those who have like, you know, pink, you know, yeah. skin or red skin and all of that. They're the one, you know, now understanding like they, there's something that's missing in the whole modern, modern view of existence. There's something that's existing. And what's, exist, what, what's missing 
is uh, actually something that is existing somewhere that they can, you know, try to, you know, represent. So I don't think, you know, our brothers, black people should be thinking like because they talk about Egypt, they talk about, you know, pharaohs and all of that, and then all of the people in the movie or all of the people that represented are people who have like, you know, uh, a skin color that's different from those original people that they're trying to imitate. That's why we call it imitation. That's why there's like an original and there's like a, something that you can imitate, a copy. Uh -huh. So now they're trying to copy it from something that was original. Now, if I'm someone who's born in the, in the US, in the United States, I'm black, and then I see someone looking, you know, uh, white trying to reproduce something like that I'm just gonna be proud I'm like wow uh -huh. that's like you know that's where I get my proud I don't even get frustrated on, on that because the culture the same way we look at race is uh, different from uh, you know uh, the culture because you don't look culture in the way that you look at race because culture is just like a culture you know there's no racism in the culture there's no you know fight between cultures and that's what our ancestors understood when they decided like well the society based on uh, on laws just like the mother society based on laws and things like that don't work it's better we start living a society that's based on principles that's based on culture that's based on you know initiating preparing people at the young age to become something in their life and that's why we live you know that type of life and i know the west would think we are savage we are undeveloped, we are, you know, poor and all of that. But you just have to be poor in something that you know you want that you never get. But we consider ourselves to be rich, to be very rich in the way that we have everything that we need. You know, we know where our food is coming from because we farm it ourselves. We know where our clothes are coming from because we have cotton that we can make our clothes. We know where our herbs are coming from because we farm it and we heal ourselves okay so how what else can you really like you know think you might need from another person if it's not something that the person has that you want but you know that you never get it so that's what you know we kind of you know see black people dealing with here uh, when 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 black people get to you know get out of that you know ice box of thinking like you know this is a place where they can get everything. That's why, like me, to be honest, my father said it. I'm going to repeat it. Uh, we have in the whole black movement, um, whole black, you know, leaders that, you know, live their life with some principle and trying to lead black people into something like, you know, reclaim your rights and civil rights and all of that. There's only one of them that we really, you know, show respect. I'm a cultural and spiritual revolutioner. My revolution is not about blood or flesh. The Earth Center, our revolution is not about blood or flesh. It's more about intellect, you know, and the spirituality. So once you really want to do a good revolution, you have to do it based on your culture, based on your people, your ancestors, you know, intelligence, and based on your ancestors' ways of life, meaning like it's their spirituality. Now, if you want to do a revolution, a, you know, whatever you might call it, a revolution, and then you're using, you know, the one who's holding you, you're using his own stuff to do revolution. You're just repeating what he really wants you to do. So only Marcus Garvey, he tried. Marcus Garvey, and he's the least that the West talk about. Even among the black people, they don't really talk a lot about Mar Marcus Garvey. Because he was the only one to tell everybody, black people, this is not your land. Go back to your original land. Let us pack and move and see if the white man will not come there and then kneel down and beg us. Black people are the one building this whole place, this whole system. Black people are building it. Gold, diamond, uh -huh. all of the things happening, money, black people are the one building it. We, your ancestors already built this place. Uh -huh. They suffered. They did it. They didn't want to do it. They were forced to do it. Uh -huh. But they did it. But they're doing it with a hope. And their hope is like maybe one day our children will benefit from what sacrifice we're given now. Now you grow up, you don't sacrifice, you like a descendant of a slave. You grow up, you don't get to benefit from it. You just know that they just want you to take the position of your father, uh -huh. meaning play the position of a slave, a slave uh -huh. again. 
I mean, you have a choice in this time. You have a choice. America didn't ask people don't go back to Africa. Mm. Even last time I checked, flying from here to go to Africa, the tickets is cheaper than flying from Africa to come here. Ah. It's cheaper, maybe almost like double, you know. So they give you, you know, option you free. This is a free land, you know. They give free country. They give you, you know, your freedom. Now, what do you have to be, you know, doing here to waste your time, waste your lives, and you know, waste your energy getting frustrated? You know, why, one thing that people need to understand about spirituality and the culture is like, as a human being in the nature, any time you get frustrated or you get angry, you all you become like the weak, the weak, the weaker, the weakest person. And then white, people, white men know that. They know that any time a human being, you get a human being to be unsettled, to be unstable in the mind and the heart, they become the weakest you know, being that you have to kind of lead them towards where you want to lead them. They understand that. So that's why every now and then they have to create those incidents to get people like, you know, to be unstable and then let it go. Let them now reorganize themselves. When they see you reaching something, get, you know, unstable. It's almost like, you know, I like talking about it and I don't know how people feel about it. But in Africa, I talk about it. You know, it's almost like when the system felt like, you know, it's, get, it's been too much for it, kind of getting to the edge of its uh, self fallen. What they decide to do is that to, you know, choose one of us to become the president. And then we have hope, like, yeah, we have one of us who's going to become the president. Now, we stop fighting. All of the other fights that we're fighting, trying to get the white men to understand, like, we want this, that's what we are, this is what we need, and all of that, we stop because we have hope, thinking, like, yes, then now there's one of us in there, he knows our problems. Now, it took us, like, what, four years to understand, like, oh, well, it looks like we still have to fight. And that's the, I mean, in the eight years, that's when you see that a lot of black people lost their life. Uh -huh. Many black people lost their life in these eight years, you know. So the system has this way of playing, you know, you know with uh, the mass. And when they play, you play with the mass, you understand the psychology of the mass of human. And then that's what you do. When you let them, you know, Bomali said it, you know, you know kill them before they, before they grow. Don't let them grow fully. You know, they grow fully, then you waste, you know, you're going to be the one kind of, you know, uh, you know losing the game. Uh -huh. So when you let them grow, in, when they reach certain age, cut them off and then put something there to create something that will bring them to the uh, point of, uh, you know, uh -huh. uh, beginning. So wow. that's how it is, you know. Wow. That's, that's very good. Yeah, it's, <laughs> almost like, it's almost like an African has to come and then teach an American how the system functions. You know, and for us, we have the humility to accept whenever there's someone f different from us, someone who didn't grow up in our culture, who comes to our place. We have the humility to listen to the person, understand what they're explaining. Now compare and see like, whoa, this thing that that person said makes sense. Let me take that and use it in my life. But here, the tendency is kind of the opposite. You know, you come. The, pe the American will look at you, he thinks you like different from him. Already, he classify you, you less than me. I mean, that's the culture of uh, the American society where even on the large, larger scale, America is presenting itself as, uh, you know, the, the number one country. So that also is like everybody in everybody's, you know, psychology. Whenever, whenever you meet someone who is different from you, you're thinking already like you above that person. But it's just like almost we have to come and say like, oh, your system is functioning this way before people can wake up and see like, oh, that's really like where it's going. So it's like a good agenda that they have. And we, can, we cannot blame white men's supremacy. We cannot blame black people, so, you know, also trying to gain supremacy. Because one thing that my father fought for, my father died for something, I have to stand for it. Now, we just have to be enough intelligent and smart to know when whatever we're fighting for or we're standing for, when it's 
you know, playing the positive, you know, posit positive game for us and when we destroying us. And then just stop when we need to stop. You know, so that's really what I can say about that. And uh, for, uh, for people's information, uh, in our culture, there's no word Egypt. Uh -huh. that's right. We don't have Egypt in anything that we do. In all of the hieroglyphs that you can go look on the walls in the, Egy I mean, in the country that they call Egypt, there's no place that you will find the word saying Egypt. Uh -huh. So it's almost like, you know, the ignorance also is playing a lot of, a lot of things. And as I said, for someone to be ignorant, you have to first be undisciplined and, you know, have like a lack of humility. Then you become ignorant because anyone who has discipline and humility, it's difficult for that person to be an ignorant person. Uh -huh. you yeah. There you have it. There you have it. Yeah. Oh, and it, that's very, 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 very deep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, I'm going to close it out, but have also the overseer come back and he'll have a closing statement. And I enjoy it very much being here. Thank Zan. you. That's <laughs> Navasan. Navasan? Yeah. <laughs> and we have a closing out statement with the uh, overseer. Again, the overseer of the Earth Center. I trust that this brief interview was very enlightening to you all, and I hope that I'll be seeing you here coming to the Earth Center. And we are located in Jamaica, Queens, and our address is 137-42 Guy R. Brewer Boulevard. Our phone number is 347-529-1399. If there's any questions that you have, I would really appreciate a call. And I also want to share with you guys, we're having a grand opening coming in, coming on the 20th of September, 2016, of course. February. February. Yeah. 20th of February, yes. And uh, it will start at 12 noon to 8 p.m. And we are extending this invitation to the entire community and that we just hope to see you there. And if you have any question again, please feel free to call. At this point, I'm gonna ask uh, Master Nava's son, Irita Shemira, to share a closing statement with you all to whatever it is that he feels he'd like to share with you. Thank you. <laughs> well, <clears throat> yeah, I'm so, I'm so uh, honored to be, you know, to be here and saying what I have to say and uh, at the end of the day, what every human being is expecting in their life is to not starve, to feel good, and to have someone who loves you or someone who cares about you. And then your ancestors to always keep standing behind you. Because what I notice that the system is doing here and uh, the kind of work the system did so well, so good in uh, this place is that they get to succeed taking every black man away from understanding that <clears throat> some people sacrifice their lives for us to be here. Some people die for us to be here. Some people have to go through hardship, through suffering for us to be here and enjoying life. And in return, the least we can do for those people is to at least acknowledge them, honor them, and see how they can assist us in our life. When we talk about an ancestor, it's not an entity that's kind of abstract, that's kind of, you know, just in people's mind, you know, as the religion and, you know, the modern uh, belief is teaching or are teaching. An ancestor is not different from someone like me. Like, I look, my father is already dead. But right now, someone can look at me and say, oh, you look like your father. It's not because I look like him, but it's because I have his blood in me. So all of those people who pass away still live in us. That's what I would like every black man in every black community 
to understand that the Earth Center will do the best we can do to display and to put this understanding and this knowledge wherever it's needed. But we have our hands are shut to be able to be everywhere in every community. But <clears throat> on the grand opening, for everybody to come and check and see what will be happening here. And then learn how to honor your ancestor, learn how to honor yourself. When I tell you honor your ancestor, I'm not telling you to come and honor my ancestor because I'm doing that for them already. I have their pictures, I leave them some food, I leave them some water, I leave them some milk every day. I'm already doing that for them. Now in return, whatever they play in me, whatever role they have to play in my life, they will play it. So please, for every black man to understand, black woman, <clears throat> to understand that there's nothing on this planet that we, as black, can do without standing on what our ancestors did before us. So I would love everybody to stand, you know, whatever fight you're fighting in your life, whatever spiritual system you're in, whether you are in Christianity or in Muslim or any spiritual system you're in, at the end of the day, you have to recognize that some people die for you. And some people gave birth to you, supported you, and at some point they passed away and they still live in you as long as you're still carrying their blood, the blood that they gave you, they still live in you. So I would have to say, may the spirit of all of us, our ancestors, those who couldn't get put on the ship to get here, those who were on the ship and end up falling in the sea in the middle of the Atlantic, and those who end up getting here and then end up falling, dead, and those who survived and then worked and put this place together for the white man to come and you know, consider himself to be the, the, the supreme leader and us to keep playing the, you know, the followers. I would like for those ancestors to visit us every now and then, enlighten us and show us the path that we need to take in our life. Because when we talk about survival, survival doesn't have to do with uh, politics. Survival doesn't have anything to do with uh, fighting other person who looks different, like who is not like you, who looks different from you. Survival is about every human being trying to survive, making sure tomorrow is better than today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right now, uh, I'm here in the Earth Center. Also, we, we, we saw last time with Verima, our uh, ancestor Verima, with explaining about the Earth Center, how they opened up. And, but we got one of the main teachers at the Earth Center now. And basically, I'm going to ask you, sir, what is your name and what brought you to the Earth Center and how many years ago? Okay. Ujai, greetings, everybody. My name is Hati Kaheru, is my name. And then the last name I go by is Nejitev. Hati Kaheru Nejitev. So what that means in the Madhu language is Hati, the manifestation, Ka, the soul, and then Heru is the, the divine god, uh, Heru, the son of Wizard. So the manifestation of the soul of Heru. Yeah. And then Nejitev means defender of the father. Yeah. In this case, the father is Wizard, the great Natera Wizard. Okay. That represents goodness. Mm. Okay. So that's my generational name. That's my initiatic name. Mm. Given by me, not by any individual, and I want to make this clear. The names that we carry or that we should carry as human beings should come from the earth itself. Through the energies that we project or that we come with or that we uh, manifest. That's where, you, you know, you don't name a human being just like you will name a, a pet. You know, every, every name should carry a meaning. Mm -hmm. So every, every time someone says your name, then they actually reminding you of what you came for mm. in this world, you know? Okay, okay. So, you know, after you go through gra uh, initiation, you start gaining certain knowledge about things. And the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know anything. 
but uh, I started, uh, let me see, around 2010, 2011. That's when I got to the Earth Center. And it's very curious how I ended up here because I didn't know anything about spirituality. I didn't know anything about culture. I pretty much didn't know anything about anything, about natural medicine, about meditation, nothing. So I was just, you know, I was one time I was with this elder who was a healer, you know, a guy from uh, one of the Spanish countries. Mm -hmm. And I used to look up to the guy, I said, hmm, he helped me out with some illnesses I had. So I said, oh, this guy is very wise. And then he said, oh, this is this, this great classes are coming in town. And I've been looking for this knowledge for like 50 years. I said, oh, great. He said, you can come and be a student just like me. I said, oh, that's awesome. So, you know, there was a, a group of friends that I used to uh, relate to. Yeah. And so I ended up coming, just accompanying them. I didn't even think about joining classes or anything. I just said, you know what? I ain't doing nothing today, so let me just go with them. See what this is about. So from the moment I stepped in, I said, wow. I was in shock. I said, oh, man. The energy I felt was like very peaceful, very calm. I said, hmm something good about this. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. I don't know yeah. what it's about, but it feels good. You know, it's like, wow, interesting. So I ended up joining classes that day. I signed up, not knowing what I was signing for. Yeah. So I signed for classes, and then just every time I went to class, it was like shocking, like, oh, man, wow, wow. This makes so much more sense than what I was taught out there. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I went to school in Colombia, the mm -hmm. U.S., and Europe. Mm -hmm. you know, I have family all over the place. Yeah. And after going through all of this regular academia, mm -hmm. then I come to this center, and within a few weeks, I'm like, wow. I'm saying this to say that what I've learned here in the little time I've been here is not compare, not even this much, to what I learned out there. Mm -hmm. In other words, what I learned out there is not worth it compared to what I learned here because what I learned here is actually what helped me become a better human being. Okay. And it has not only affected my life, but my immediate family. You know, my daughter, my wife, my father, mm -hmm. my grandfather, mm -hmm. who they cut off his leg, tell your, tell your story. Mm -hmm. They chop off his leg, the doctors. They said, oh, sir, you have no circulation on the, on the leg, and uh, we need to cut it off. I said, why? He said, yeah, we need to cut it off. So the elders in the family, which are his oldest uh, sons and daughters, mm -hmm. they said, you know what? Let him go ahead and cut his leg off, because that's all they know. Mm -hmm. They don't know any better. So because the doctors say that's the best option, they went with it and they went ahead and cut my uh, grandfather's leg. Mm. They said that that, would, that will solve the issue completely. That will get rid of the problem. So a month after, he goes back to the hospital because then the problem came to this leg. He had like a wound mm -hmm. that, that wouldn't heal. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know what? That wound is not gonna heal. Uh, the circulation is not good. We gotta chop it off as well. That's when I said, wait a minute. Now you're going to go ahead and cut the other leg? Why don't you just hear, hear me out for one time? I know you guys are older than me, and, you know, but hear me out. You know, mm -hmm. just very humbly, just hear me out. Hear my options. Just use my method. I'll pay for it and everything. Mm -hmm. You don't have to give me anything. Just try it out. Maybe it works. Mm -hmm. Maybe. So I sent the medicine. You know, I spoke with the, with the healers. I said, you know, this is going on. How can we help him out? So the healer said, you know what? Send them, send them this and this. So I sent it, and it's been about two weeks since he finished his cycle of medicine. The wound is healed, the pain is gone, and he looks much better. See, so it's all natural. And he hasn't had a consultation yet. 
this is just medicine that the healer sent them based on what I told him. I'm pretty sure if the, if the healer goes and do a consultation, he will feel much, much better than he really feels now. So basically what you're saying is that there's something to have healers that know about medicine and medical areas, because a lot of these days the doctors out there basically about money out there. And the old, I guess the old saying is you gotta go natural, it's better. Back to the earth. Of course, because we belong to earth. Mm -hmm. We are an extension of the earth. Every, everything and everybody standing on earth belongs to the earth, you know? And so we cannot become an obstacle to the earth. We got to be in harmony with the earth okay. in order to survive. Okay. So, so what do you think about, you hear a lot of these different areas say about, they look at this kind of area like, oh, that's, oh, that's voodoo, oh, that's that magic. And what do you say about them people who think that all this is just uh, folks' tale? I'll tell you what, man, I was there. I was one of those guys that was afraid of spirituality, that was afraid of the culture. I would see it as like, ooh, that's witchcraft. You know, that, that's not no good. But then you, after you start coming to class and you start learning certain things, you realize that it is portrayed like that by the media for a reason, you know? Because they need to stay in power to, to, to control us and to have their system functioning. Mm -hmm. So they need to make us believe that what we own, what is ours, mm -hmm. is evil, is mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. So that we don't look that way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the reason why. And I tell you, man, I was one of them. Because I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. And now that I know better, I realize that, hey, this is the way. We got to go back to the ancestral ways. There's no other way. Well, I, see a lot of, I see a lot about ancestors. I see all your ancestors. I see a lot about ancestors. So what basically, basically is, is everything go back to ancestors. Like some people think that, OK, you got you to worship this. Worship, but I see a lot of ancestral areas up in here. Explain how deep is ancestors to the culture. Well, I'll try to make it brief. You see it on my shirt honor your ancestors. So I'll give you a, a little bit of an example. You have any kids? Yes, I do, I got one son. <laughs> okay, so for all the parents out there, they will, they will agree with me. When you have children, you want, you want the best for your children. Regardless of what you know or don't know, regardless of where you stand, every parent wants the best for their children. So they'll grab onto whatever they have to try to provide the, be the best for them. Our ancestors are like our parents. They are our parents and elders on the spiritual world, on the world of the dead. Mm -hmm. They want the best for us. Mm -hmm. But just like any parent, if you are misbehaving, they're going to punish you. If you are doing well, they're going to reward you. You know, that's the role they play. That's why as a human being, you have to pay honor to the ones that were here before you, mm -hmm. to your bloodline, to your destiny line, to your ancestors, mm -hmm. because they are the ones that you can really go and pray to because they are the ones that care for you. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it is said on, on many of the DVDs, the Makaru, the prophet would say that, hey, no human can go up to the gods and say, give me these, give me that. They won't listen to you because we are corruptible and corrupt. Mm -hmm. But we can go to our ancestors, which can act as an intermediary with the Neteru, which is the gods, and ask our wishes for us in our behalf. Mm -hmm. So that's why our ancestors are so important for us because they are the ones that mediate for us. They are the ones that care for us. So if we stand strong, if we stand on their good side, they're going to bless us. Mm. And they're going to allow every blessings coming from the Neteru. Because I'll tell you this too. I'll give you another example. If my child is misbehaving, and let's say you or you come and say, hey, can I give this candy to your daughter? I'll say, no. Nope. She has not behaved well. Don't give her anything. 
if you come and she's been behaving well and you say, hey, can I give this little gift to your daughter? I'll say, oh, yeah, go ahead. She deserves it. Mm. You, you, you get the point? Mm. It's, it's something uh, very difficult to understand. It's, it, it has uh, a lot of depth, this subject. What else does school specialize in? Understand healing and what else would it teach in school? Well, the basic, the basic, uh, the basic idea that I got from being initiated is the school is just trying to build better human beings. You know, the Prophet Nebnabala Musa saw the need that we had in the states because you know you see the way this is. So you know, he said this people really needs the knowledge. So the main focus of the school is to preserve life, to preserve the earth, to preserve humanity, to uplift humanity, to enlighten humanity. He, he says, if, if you can't be a star in the sky, just at least try to be a firefly on the earth. You know? And so, uh, I would like to close up. Are we ready to close up? I would, I would like to close up uh, with a story. This story was written by the prophet. Uh, it was told to me by a Hatini. So I really didn't read it anywhere. I just, I've been meditating on it. Mm -hmm. So I might say it with, with some different words, but uh, I'll try my best to uh, share this story to the best of my ability. Uh, th there was uh, this merchant Back in the days, there was this very wealthy merchant who had four wives. So the fourth wife, he loved the most. That was the wife he loved the most. He treated her the best. He tried to give her all what she needed, all what she asked for. He, she was the most spoiled one, mm -hmm. his fourth wife. Then he had his third wife. He also loved her very much. And uh, she was very pretty. So she would be like her, she would be like his trophy. She would be like the one he would show around, like, hey, this is my wife, you know? That was his third wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he had his second wife. This wife, she was a uh, very, uh, how you call it, uh, very, uh, she used to help him a lot. Like she was very caring. You know, she was always there for him in times of troubles. Mm -hmm. So she would always give him advice. You know, she was always there for him. And then he loved her a lot too. Then he had his first wife. She was not as pretty. She was actually not, not that pretty. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't really pay attention to her. She didn't have any attention from him. He didn't really even think about her, worry about her at all. Mm -hmm. But she loved him the most, his first wife. One time, the merchant got sick to the point where he was uh, ready to die. And you know, he was ready to die and he was worried. He's like, damn, man. I'm actually dying. I don't want to go by myself. Mm -hmm. Let me ask my fourth wife, who is the one that I love the most. And so he said, hey, my love, I cared about you the most. I gave you my best. I did my all for you. Will you come with me after dying? She said, no, I won't. And she just disappeared. Mm -hmm. So he was destroyed. When he asked the third wife, he said, wife, my love, will you come with me after death? Will you accompany me? She said, no, actually, as soon as you die, I'm gonna remarry someone else. And she just took off as well. He was devastated after that. He's like, damn. Then he went on to his second wife which I told you is the one that was always there for him, always mm -hmm. gave him advice. She was always there for him in hard times. Mm -hmm. He asked her, my love, you've always been there for me. You always 
hold me down. You always help me out in, in, in rough times. I know you will come with me. I'm pretty sure you will come with me. Will you come with me after that? She said, no, unfortunately, I cannot go there with you. I'm uh -huh. sorry. After you die, that's as far as I go. He was destroyed. Soon as after that, he heard a voice. This very skinny, very destroyed little woman, you know. His first wife. Soft voice. I will go with you. I will accompany you. So he said, wow. The one that I never cared about, the one that I never invested my time on, the one that I never paid attention to, is coming with me. If I would have known, I would have taken way better care of you when I was able to, when I was alive, when I was good to do it. Wow. So the message behind this story is pretty simple. Every human being has this four wives, you know? Every human being has this four, four wives. The fourth wife is our body. Mm. We're very superficial. We give our body the best, you know, we treat it as, we treat our body as if our body is us, you know, like really us, mm -hmm. but it's really not. So the fourth wife is our body. The third wife, is our wealth, our titles, you mm. know? Okay. That's why the third wife said, as soon as you die, I'm gonna remarry someone else. Oh. Because your wealth, you are not taken with you. Okay. You don't take your body with you when you die. Mm -hmm. You don't take your wealth and your titles with you when you die either. Okay. They go to someone else on this, on this existence. Okay. That's the third wife, the material. The second wife, is your family. They will always be there with you, but they also don't go with you after you die. Mm -hmm. They will always be there and they go as far as, as far as burying you, but that's as far as they will go. That's the second wife, mm. your family. Wow. The first wife is your soul. Mm. And in this modern system, we are so busy worried about those other three wives and whatever all distractions that we face that we forget about really investing time and energy into our soul. Wow. That's the first wife. So I want to leave it with that story so that we can all meditate on it so that we don't wait until it's too late to realize that, uh, you know, we are kind of wasting our life pretty much if we are not investing in our own evolution mm. in our soul. Hey, that's deep. Hey. Thank you. Uh, Iri Heru. This has been a presentation of Claude Jones the Real Talk presents the Earth Center. It was deep. See you next time.